moving from missions to challenges to concrete projects and how do you need to actually build a, an entire ecosystem of, of stakeholders a coalition of, uh, of of actors around the mission and how then the evaluation and learning really should be embedded into those various portfolios and, um, and pro projects uh, programs so this becomes a, a, a longer process a long-term um, uh, project and um, work around um, monitoring the evaluation and this is what we have been learning so far in these seminars and in, in various work that we have been trying to do over the last couple of years around monitoring and evaluation of missions and then transformative policies so here on the right hand side you see some of the keywords emerging i think um, uh, around uh, both collective learning and uh, iterative and reflective learning but it's also really important to you know the, the diversity of data uh, sets and data points and what is particularly challenging, I think, uh, for many government organizations is actual experimental work in terms of um, not thinking or not planning ahead uh, to the to, to, to very detail all of the projects that we're trying to do in a concrete mission or a transformative policy, but actually being able to switch things off and switch things on uh, uh, as we go on and learn. And here on the left hand side, you you see the sort of the idea that you that you need to have a different levels of evaluation as well in terms of looking at programs or projects and then you go up to a, a portfolio of programs and projects and at the end of that at the highest level you, you really need to understand also the various systemic interactions and externalities that we are actually creating through and um, these different uh, interactions and, and interventions but these are the things that we are we are learning and of course today we um, or the last time we had a month ago uh, first seminar and this is a quick summary uh, what we learned from more academic discussion as it were where where we saw that there is a, a shift uh, from summative to formative evaluation of learning so rather than having a a very very strict and very linear approach to learning and saying this is what we achieved or we didn't achieve actually trying to understand why certain outcomes were achieved and um, and or why they were not achieved and also, of course, the, this idea that we need to actually build um, capabilities and capacities to monitor and evaluate this kind of new generation of policies that are much more, you know, focused on reflection and focused on on also working with various various types of data, various types of um, methodologies, but also various types of uh, stakeholders and, and actually keeping them involved in these processes as well. And and also, of course, that. Uh, that evaluation and monitoring should not be seen as the last stage of the of the policy uh, cycle, but actually should be accompanying uh, all of those um, policy cycle um, elements. And what we learned from the first seminar was that the repl replicability was one of the key issues. That how do we actually create monitoring and, and evaluating systems that can be replicated within the same policy area and in the same country, but let alone then how can the lessons be, be drawn uh from from that and i think that one of the key challenges uh was how do we actually transform the business as, as usual because even if organizations are willing to and very happy to uh, experiment with new types of policies they tend to actually revert to businesses uh, as, as usual uh, quite easily and so this is what we what we're trying to do today as i said so this is the middle seminar but and we have one more seminar coming up in june do check us out and, and uh, please uh get in, in touch or register for this event so today we have three speakers as we have last time so we have uh, first the speakers will give their perspectives and at the end we have uh, more than half an hour for your questions and, and, and reflections but again as you're going along please use the chat and q a function to give your reflections you can also introduce yourself who you are and where you're coming from uh, please again use the chat function so we uh, we have a bit more interaction and going and so as I said today we have a really global um, perspective which um, we are very glad about. So we first have uh, uh, uh Arma from UN Economic Commission for Africa and talking about their experiences um, with evaluation monitoring and how they are uh, trying to shift uh, existing practices. Then we have Dr. Ruth Putik um, from UK's Open Innovation Team in the government talking about uh, um, the, the, the idea of what is evidence and how the standards of evidence and, and how, how should we practice uh, uh, these kind of uh, new approaches to evidence uh, creation. And finally, we have Aditi Chatterjee uh, talking about um, uh, her experiences, really working with, uh, with the various uh, actors uh, from, from US 
uh, to India and UK and 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 a lot of a lot of things in between. So we have really an international breadth of um, experiences today. And without further ado, I will stop scrolling my screen and um, give the floor to Bartholomew for his um, presentation. And as I said, I'll, I'll let you know when you have two minutes left. Uh, thank you. Um, and um, while I prepare my presentation for delivery, um, just to say that um, this is um, a presentation on some of the work that we are doing in ECA in the area of supporting uh, development planning. Um, on the continent. Okay, I'm done. Um, I've got a little difficult accessing the website. But um, what I wanted to do was to share with you uh, what we call the integrated planning and reporting tool of ECA, which we use to Um, I seem to be having some problems getting the screen. Um, the uh, oh, you're not sharing your screen the yet. Website, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm not sharing yet. But I was trying to get the website um, where this, the the um, the system is located is um, is not um, coming up. But I can. I can revert to a, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so let me share my screen for now. Just a second. So can you see the screen? Um, no, we can see our desktop. <laughs> We're back to that problem. Um, yeah, now we can we can do the screen, but <clears throat> I think you have to switch to. Um, we can see the next slide as well. You know what I mean. So we have a presenter view rather than a. Yeah. So if, you, um, if you can click on the display settings. That's right. Yeah, just above the slideshow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You move up. If you move even up. Yeah, display settings. Yes, you're almost there. I see your cursor. I see your mouse. Yeah, display settings. Yeah, if you click on that, there you should be able to. May click on this? No, that's not. Um... Yeah. Display settings. Or you can just use the slides as they are now. I think it's, yeah, it doesn't um, because yeah, otherwise we are we are using the time. Yeah, I know. Um, okay, so yeah, so um, yeah, so we um, developed this system. Unfortunately, it's for some reason not. It was showing a few minutes ago, but it stopped. So we tried to answer the following question. Um, uh, you know, countries have been uh, uh, always asked to integrate. Uh, the new new development commitments or global commitments such as 20 agenda 2030 into their national development plan and um, but the, we know that that's not the only um, global commitment they have so there are multiple commitments and so the question is how do you ensure that you can integrate all of these into your national plan 
um, in a way that is coherent and consistent because uh, the assumption is that not all the commitments are discrete and unrelated. So for example, you have the Samoa pathway, you have Agenda 2030, um, and currently uh, for least developed countries, you have the Doha program of action. All of these commitments are related. So to be able to coherently integrate them into your national plan, you need to understand the relationships among them. And this is what we call the horizontal uh, integration or horizontal alignment. So uh, that is one challenge that countries uh, have, and that's one of the things the um, system uh, IPRT seeks to address. And then the second is to be able to then integrate them into your national plan and track all of these um, commitments in a way that is seamless and coherent. In other words, you don't want to have a situation where you're tracking your national plan separately from tracking your performance on the SDGs. And in Africa, the operational uh, agenda is what we call Agenda 2063, tracking that separately. So really, how do you use technology to ensure simultaneous tracking of all of these commitments, at least a minimum set of them, uh, in a way that makes sense, and then leverage that information. Um, and then um, how do you then add this additional layer of financing, right? Because you can track performance, uh, but in your evaluation of that performance, you need to understand why you underperformed and why you overperformed in some cases. Uh, adding the financing dimension gives you some uh, clues as to why some outcomes were not achieved. So really layering, uh, um, adding the layer of financing to development planning in one digital uh, or dashboard is something that would be is desirable for countries, particularly in a time when we countries are experiencing financial challenges. It's really about ensuring value for money in the use of resources. So. The IPRT basically aims to use technology to sort of answer some of these questions. Um, now, the, um, the the financing dimension of this uh, relates to, um, so this is really showing some of the, how it does this. So how does it align? How does it show the relationship between the SDGs and other development agendas? The way it does this is through a mapping of the SDGs to these other agendas to see the synergies. And then how does it align the national plans to the SDGs and the other agendas? It also does this through a mapping mechanism. Um, the system also maps budgets to national development uh, targets and then generates uh, uh, and tracks this performance at the same time. So because the national plans can be aligned to uh, financing sources and to the SDGs, it is possible to generate a report that just filters out only those indicators in the national plan that are aligned to say the SDGs so that you can generate an SDG uh, report within the context of the national plan. And similarly to generate a report for other commitments by doing the same filtering mechanism. So by having all this information in one system, you can do filtering to then uh, do customized reporting based on the alignment that you want to focus on. And so really this is how you, this is how the system exploits the benefits of digitalization and technology to, to ensure seamless um, reporting and, uh, and minimize all the, uh, the uh, work that is involved in doing this. So let me move quickly to sort of talk about how the, there are similar um, tools out there that seem to, you know, uh, attempt to do a similar, achieve similar objectives. But what makes the IPRT distinctive is that um, it's automated in the sense that these, some of the reports that are, the reports that are generated are automated. It, uh, it also tracks performance. And um, it um, takes into account not only the 2030 agenda, but other agendas such as Agenda 2063, and, and we're in the process of including the Doha Program of Action. And it has these intelligent uh, data visualization dashboards 
um, that help countries to sort of understand the extent to which they are aligned using color codes and the genesis reports. But most importantly, um, you know, the most development plans are based on a results framework that have goals, targets, and indicators. And this um, um, IPRT can basically diagnose your results framework and tell you, for example, how many of your goals have targets, how many of your targets have indicators, and how many of your indicators actually have data or baselines. So that diagnostic also helps to improve the planning process. Um, so moving right along, um, what I, what the um, the first page of the of the IPRT shows you a dashboard of the at, uh, at least in this case it shows you the dashboard of the Agenda 2030 and Africa's Agenda 2063. And this information here, this dashboard has at least two bits of information. First, it helps countries to recall what exactly is SDG is about, how many goals does it have, how many indicators. By clicking any of these uh, color-coded um, uh, buttons um, uh, in the color codes in this um, dashboard, you can get information about each of these goals and targets. Now, in Africa, the challenge of experience is that the, there's not much knowledge about the Agenda 2063, but more information, more people know about the SDGs than Agenda 2063. So this can also serve as an, it also serves as an uh, advocacy mechanism whereby a country individuals or policymakers can click on all the, the goals of this Agenda 2063, and it gives you all the information about the goals. So it, it, it really um, gives you a one-stop shop in terms of information about those goals. But more importantly, for each goal that you click, it tells you what is the relationship with the agenda goals, corresponding goals of Agenda 2030, and vice versa. So it really helps you understand not only each agenda by itself, but how that agenda relates to the other um, agenda. Uh, so for example, if you look at um, the um, agenda 2063 has a goal 11, uh, which talks about democratic values, um, you can then relate that to this goal 16 of agenda 2030 to see the relationship. So what it does, what the system can do is that it shows you for this agenda, uh, for goal 16 of the SDGs, these five goals, uh, four goals of agenda 2030 or 2063 have some relationship to goal 16 of the um, agenda 2030. So this is simply a visual, uh, uh, representation of what we call vertical alignment. Um, and um, this is a, an example of an alignment report that is generated by the system for Zambia. It's unfortunate I can't, uh, uh, okay, I would have liked to expand this. But anyway, so what this is saying is that, um, you know, the color codes represent degrees of alignment. Now on the left, uh, dashboard, you have the inner circle which shows you the goals of Agenda 2063, and the in the middle we have the indicators, and the, in the outer perimeter you have the, I'm sorry, in the middle we have the targets, and in the outer perimeter we have the indicators. And uh, a green color means that um, the goals of the SDGs are um, fully aligned with um, the goals of the um, of the national uh, development plan. So the question that is asked is is what goals in the SDG of the SDGs can be found in a national development plan, and are the goals as the described exactly the same as what you see in the national plan or are they partially the same when when there's a sort of a proxy indicator or proxy goal it shows up as yellow which means that it's a partial alignment and when there's a red when the g the goal is red it means that 
there is no corresponding goal in a national development plan that looks like any of the uh, uh, goal 14 of the SDGs. And this is the same thinking when you look at the uh, targets and the indicators. So what you wanted to have is more greens than, than yellows, more yellows than red. And we compute a figure which is like 60% of the Zambia's plan is aligned to the SDGs. But what we found is that when you break this down at the goal, target, and indicator level, the level of alignment declines from, say, 85% at the goal level to 30% at the indicator level. But another observation is that you have stronger alignment of national plans with the SDGs than with the Agenda 2063. It's 48% for Zambia. Uh, at the goal level, it's 52%, and at the indicator level, it's 41%. So it gives you sort of some precision in the alignment and also does this uh, at the goal target and indicator level. These are just simply the same information but written out for other countries like Botswana and Malawi. Um, now, the system also allows you to zero in on a particular goal and how that country is aligned to that particular goal. So this is a more a focused to look at goal 16 of the SDGs and how this relates to Malawi's uh, Zambia's development plan. And the more reds you see, the more, the less the alignment at that particular level of, uh, of, 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 of alignment, so to speak. But let me um, uh, then um, sort of talk about how we get countries to train, how we train countries in this process. We start with first helping them to migrate their, their results framework into the, the system, the IPRT. Uh, we also then uh, a, a populate the monitoring and evaluation module of the IPRT with the country's data. And then we undertake the alignment. And we also then include a budget information into the system to be able to align with, support the alignment of their budgets, budget programs with the National Development Plan, and then we generate reports for them. The reports, an example of the alignment report is what I just showed you. Um, now, how is the alignment carried out? Um, it really is based on some element of sub subjectivity because it walks the policymaker through a series of questions. So the first question, would be, for example, with respect to the SDGs, we start with the, at the yeah, goal. Two level. minutes, two minutes per Two yeah. minutes, great. Yeah. Um, I'll be wrapping up. So it walks the policymaker through a series of questions about the extent to which the, that SDGs can be found in a national plan, whether this alignment is, uh, whether the corresponding goal in a national plan is a, is a proxy indicator or not, and to explain some of the reasons why um, if it is not in the national plan to explain why it is not in the national plan. And this helps us to really understand um, the, the extent, reasons why countries, um, the reasons underpinning their uh, priorities in the national plan. Um, so these are some of the alignment definitions that we use. Um, and um, this is an example of, uh, of Uganda's uh, uh, plan where we're looking at how its programs in relation to innovation, mineral-based industrialization, and integrated transport services relate to the SDG 9 um, of the plan. Now, the prerequisites for, for the alignment process is really um, that we understand the the structure of their results framework, because we are really comparing their results framework, which may have so many different levels, to simply comparing them to the goals of the SDGs, the targets, and the indicators. And so, as you can see here, in some cases, the structure of a national plan is not the same as the structure of the SDGs or Agenda 2063. So having that kind of conversation also helps them to restructure or understand the links between their plan and the SDGs. Uh, I know I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to um, sort of um, conclude by talking about the financing part. 
And really what we try to do with the financing part in terms of looking at how the budgets are related to plans is to understand what their sources of financing for their national development plan are, whether the budget is one of the sources, and how we can identify whether the budgetary resources are actually being allocated to the different priorities. Uh, the system also tracks the spending of the budget allocations to the national plan and um, it relates to, to the integrated national financing program. But due to lack of time, I'm not going to go into the integrated financing frameworks, but this is something that is currently uh, in, in, in an area of interest, really ensuring that country resources are, are used in a way that optimally achieves their development uh, objectives. So um, let me conclude by saying that the IPRT is a flexible tool with multiple advantages in terms of alignment, tracking, and alignment, not only of uh, the plan with the SDGs, but also with national financing frameworks. Um, and uh, it really makes the process of tracking performance much easier once the information is populated. So I'll stop here and take questions uh, once this is uh, over. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bartholomew. Yeah, you can, you can um, stop sharing the screen. We'll do the questions right after that. But I think there is a, I already see in the chat, there is a couple of questions emerging around uh, data availability. And, and it will be really interesting to hear how governments are, are using it actually and how they are, what kind of feedback there is actually from this tool to governments um, you know, learning what, uh, what they're doing. So we'll, we'll get back to that, a really fascinating tool. But we'll now go to uh, Ruth Putik. Um, she's at the moment working uh, for the UK government's Open Innovation Team. Um, and, and she's also doing a, a large scale study of uh, evidence centers in Australia at the moment. And prior uh, to this, she has been working, among other things, uh, with uh, UK's Innovation Foundation, Nesta, where she did and very interesting work around evidence. And so I think this is what we'll hear today. So the floor is yours, Ruth. Thank you. I'm going to try and share my screen, so bear with me. I can't see you, but can you see slides and here? Yes. Perfect. Yes, it is. Full Super. Full screen. Uh, all right, lovely. Uh, so, yes, so um, I'm going to talk today about um, standards of evidence, which is one approach to try and balance evidence and innovation. I'm going to talk about three things, the intersection of evidence and innovation. I'm then going to talk in detail about what standards of evidence are, and in particular, focus in on the Nesta standards of evidence. And then I'm going to close with some considerations and lessons learned. So the drive for evidence based decision making and the need for innovation in government has rapidly accelerated in recent years. And despite often overlapping goals, it's not always clear how aligned the two agendas are. Um, yeah, evidence and innovation are inextricably intertwined. R&D is, after all, the traditional cornerstone of a functioning innovation system. If we fail to test and experiment with new innovations, we don't know what's working and what isn't. And the two reform agendas of innovation and evidence have very similar goals of improving government, creating better public services, positively impacting social and economic outcomes and saving money. And even when looked at as two separate reform agendas, the world of innovation and evidence share many similarities. Both are not rational or linear processes. Both attempt to change complex systems. Both are contested terms or open to multiple interpretations and are highly contextual. Both encounter issues of skills, capacity, capabilities, resources, and awareness. Evidence informs innovation and the innovation process creates evidence. The two agendas are symbiotic. And then thirdly, but the two worlds are often disconnected. Government innovation is now an accepted and mainstream concept. You can find departments, ministries, labs, and other units tasked with spurring innovation in cities, regions, and nations across the globe. And there are numerous academic institutes, consultancies, and foundations working to support these efforts. And sat alongside this is the evidence-based agenda. It has built up considerable momentum over the past 10 years. In the UK, for example, we've seen the creation of the What Works Network. In the US, there's been various, numerous, um, there's been numerous evidence initiatives, including the suites of Obama reforms, such as the I3 education programme. But despite overlapping goals, it's not always clear how closely aligned the two agendas are. 
Um, and at Nesta, we always thought there could be value for the evidence agenda to look through an innovation lens. Who's making the decisions? Why, when, and what is their goal? Uh, for those of you that don't know Nesta, it's the UK's innovation agency, and it uses the innovation spiral that shows shown on this slide. It provide, the spiral provides a useful starting point. It breaks down the stages of innovation from problem recognition through to idea development through to systems change. The decision taking at each stage will require different types of evidence. For example, something that's just an idea and has not yet been developed will undergo different testing using different methods and different generate different types of evidence than a policy or a program or a practice that is well established and operational in multiple locations. We use the innovation process as a starting point to develop the Nesta standards of evidence. And before I talk about those, I want to give a bit more of a background context about what standards of evidence are. So what are standards of evidence? I think we could all agree uh, that evidence is vital for effective decisions to be made. Yet evidence can often be lacking in decisions. There can be confusion about what evidence looks like, or there could be different types of evidence, making it unclear how confident we can be or in what the data is saying. And this is where standards of evidence usefully come in. Over the past decade, there's been a growing interest in standards of evidence and other evidence frameworks that help us to understand what is working and what isn't by grading effectiveness or impact against a scale or level. Typically, the lower levels indicate that there is some evidence and as the scale or level is ascended, more evidence is available to increase confidence in deciding whether the intervention or the policy or practice is working. Standards of evidence aren't particularly new. There are uh, numerous examples used in academia, such as the Maryland Scientific Method Scale and elsewhere as well. Back in 2011, um, I published a paper which looked at standards of evidence used in social policy across the UK, and it found that there's been a rapid proliferation of standards of evidence since 2000. In 2018, there were 18 standards of evidence being used in UK social policy by a range of organisations, including charities, foundations and governmental organisations. And they span a range of different policy areas, including health, social care, local economic growth, well-being and crime. And it's just worth pointing out that standards of evidence can have different focus. Um, they can be grouped in four ways. So standards of evidence um, can look at specific interventions, which might be well-defined programs, uh, such as nurse family partnerships, through to more thematic topics and areas such as homework. Then there are bodies of evidence that standards of evidence can look, like, look at, which might be an evidence review or a meta-analysis on a particular topic. Standards of evidence can also look at an organization's readiness to evaluate or to replicate. And then the first grouping is standards of evidence, which look at the quality of an evaluation, such as how robust the study is and how confident we can be in its findings. So I'll focus now on the Nesta standards of evidence. Um, I worked at Nesta for seven years and helped to develop its uh, evidence for social policy and practice programme. And as part of that, I worked with a colleague there to develop the Nesta standards of evidence framework. So this is what the standards look like. Um, we developed these back in 2012 and they draw heavily on other frameworks being used elsewhere, particularly you, those used by Project Oracle. And I co-developed these with um, my colleague, Joe Ludlow, who at the time was the director of Nesta's Impact Investment Fund. Nesta had had uh, an investment fund for a number of years. And when Nesta transitioned into being a charitable foundation, it was still going to uh, invest for a profit. But there was also a push for it to make much more explicit the social return. Joe, the director of the team, and I had a conversation and he said, it's easy to see whether investments are making a financial return, but it's much harder to determine what the social impact is going to be or is. So as a result of these conversations, we developed the Nesta Standards of Evidence Framework, which is broadly aligned with the stages of innovation. Level one is a very early stage innovation, which could just be an idea in someone's head, up to level five, where the product or service is being used in multiple locations. As the levels have progressed, it's expected that data will be collected to isolate the impact of the intervention, that findings are validated externally, and then at level five, there's demonstrable evidence that the product or service can be delivered at multiple locations and still deliver a strong positive impact. Or to put it in innovation jargon, uh, the impact is scalable. As products and services move up the standards of evidence, so will our certainty that they will have a positive impact on the intended outcome. 
even if a product or service uh, successfully reaches level five, we did not see this as an endpoint. Um, we saw evidence as only of a partial time bound and needs to be seen as an ongoing exercise, enabling continual reflection, refinement and improvement. At each stage, the quality of the evidence was assessed by the team to assure it was robust and of high quality. And it's worth noting that when we developed these, it was the first time that standards of evidence had been used in an, in an investment fund context. So it was something of an experiment. So Nesta uses the standards of evidence um, in three ways. After it was initially developed for the investment fund, it was then used more widely across its grant programs as well. And it uses it in three ways. Firstly, to determine whether a grant or an investment should be rewarded. It will ask the question, is that having an impact and how confident can we be in its claims? Secondly, the standards of evidence are used to help assess how well an intervention is doing um, to help track progress. And then thirdly, for the, sta the standards of evidence are used to help plan for a future evaluation for that grant or investment. The standards of evidence model helps to answer an important innovation question, which is, is an innovation doing any good or is it doing harm? Or is the status quo just as good as the new idea? It provides a robust framework for choosing the right, right approach to understand whether an innovation is working. And one of the key strengths of the Nesta standards of evidence is it can enable innovation and evidence to coexist. It, it brings products and services in line with academically recognized levels of evidence, but at an, a, pay, a pace and an approach which is appropriate to their individual development. This means it does not demand particular methods, but instead enables organizations to select an evaluation approach appropriate to them and to move up the standards of, move up the standards of evidence at a pace that will not hinder their work or their innovative development. Since we developed them at Nesta, they've been um, used elsewhere. One of the early applications was um, by Pearson, the global education company. I worked with them when I was at Nesta to help adapt the standards of evidence framework to be used in their global product and service range. And this was an interesting um, application as the private sector and companies are often missed out about debates about evidence for social policy and practice. Um, I did some searching over the last couple of weeks and was quite surprised at where else they've, uh, they've been used and are cropping up. So the Swedish innovation body, Vinova, has translated them for what they call their impact logic model. RAND Europe uses them um, to investigate their health of the effectiveness of health and well-being programmes. Sport England has developed them uh, to use in their measurement framework. The UK Government Evaluation Task Force, which is a joint Treasury and Cabinet Office um, unit, which aims to put evaluation at the heart of government, promotes the standards of evidence framework. And it particularly promotes um, programmes at level three and above and considers these particularly robust. The Youth Futures Foundation applied the standards in its review of its own programmes and services. The Shine Trust uses it with grantees. The Y Lab, which is the Public Service Innovation Lab for Wells, um, asks applicants to assess where they sit on the standards of evidence and then to commit to you if they secure funding or repayable fi finance that they will work to, to move up the levels as part of that uh, investment. And then interestingly, the Crown Prosecution Service is also using the Nesta Standards of Evidence as a tool in how it thinks about um, challenging its own thinking regarding evaluation. So in terms of some of the benefits of using a Standards of Evidence um, framework, um, some of rise a few of these. So the Standards of Evidence prompts a conversation about what evidence is and what impacts can be expected. Just asking investees or grantees to demonstrate their impact can be an overwhelming question. To have a graded scale helps to start a conversation about what is appropriate, proportionate and useful. The Nesta Sands of Evidence provide flexibility on methods um, to ensure we're selecting the most promising, safe and efficient innovations. We need high quality evidence of impact, but it doesn't associate evidence with particular types of research or data. Instead, it's interested in high quality, robust and appropriate evidence, which helps identify the most promising innovations and continues to generate useful evidence as they develop. And there's also a aim for continual learning and development. There is a movement through the levels with solutions going back and forth to enable continual reflection and adjustment as needed. 
The adoption of the Nesta standards of evidence is an incredibly positive move and signals a growing commitment to testing and identifying what is and isn't working. However, there's some key considerations and lessons that have been learned. So evidence, just like innovation, is not linear. And in the same way innovation is messy, so is testing and adapting. The way that the framework is depicted makes uh, it look like a linear process. And furthermore, it can be interpreted that level five is better than level one, which is not. Uh, the standards of evidence aim to think about the appropriateness to the stage of the innovation. A second consideration is that the standards of evidence require the ability for people and organizations to undertake high quality evaluation. And critically, it relies on users, which might be funders, commissioners, policymakers, and others, to be able to identify and understand high quality evidence and to use it. So there's a skills and capability issues here. Who pays for an impact evaluation is an interesting question. Unless a funder stipulates that there needs to be progression through the levels, organisations can often be unwilling or unable to move up through the levels. Um, to give you an example of this, um, there was a programme called Project Oracle, which was based in London and used standards of evidence to evaluate youth service programmes. It found that once the grant funding had ended for an organisation, few organisations continued to be evaluated because they could no longer necessarily afford to do so. And so few moved beyond level one. Linked to this in part is the issue of failure. People often talk about failure as a natural side of innovation, but I don't think we're actually still all that sophisticated about thinking about what failure actually means. Failure is rarely all that clear cut. Um, to give an example, uh, I know of a charity that underwent a randomized control trial. And due to a low sign up of recruitments, the trial was underpowered and generated non-significant results. This was interpreted by some as a sign of program and organizational failure, rather than potentially and most likely because of study design. Yet the only way to, for, to know for sure if it's a non-significant result because of, because of chance, a lack of power, or if indeed uh, there are, are a lack of treatment benefits, there needs to be more research. But often funders and others don't want to wait around for that and instead interpret non-significant findings as a sign of failure. And this can be devastating to an organization. And it introduces large disincentives for organizations to voluntarily put themselves forward for scrutiny. And I don't want that to sound like I don't think innovation pro ineffective programs should be stopped. I think if ineffective programs are found, they should absolutely um, be stopped. But for me, this example indicates more that we're a long way from thinking genuinely openly about being open to experimentation, learning and innovation at all times. So just a few um, concluding thoughts. Um, standards of evidence can help to understand what is and isn't working. And I've case studied the Nesta standards of evidence that uh, aim to align evidence and innovation. There's been multiple application and uses of these since they were developed for Nesta's Impact Investment Fund, and they've been adopted in a range of different organizations. There are some key lessons to be learned and more that's, that's needed. For example, at all levels, evidence should be high quality. And for this, both users and producers of evidence need support and guidance and possibly funding. And despite the rapid sophistication, both the evidence and innovation agendas are still, still have issues surrounding failure. What it is, how we deal with it, how it's managed. Um, it's beyond my 10 minute talk, um, but there are some interesting debates about moving from failure to reframe, reframing it more around a learning agenda. I really like Amy Edmondson's work around praiseworthy and blameworthy failure, and that's worth a read if you haven't already seen it. Um, I will leave it there and I'll look forward to the discussion. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you so much for this, uh, uh, this presentation. Very, very interesting. A lot of really interesting questions and, um, and issues to be, to be unpicked, hopefully, in the discussion as well. So, but uh, before that, uh, we we will hear from Aditi, uh, uh, who is an expert in, in monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning. And she has been working with donors and clients at the Global Fund to End uh, Modern Poverty, Innovation for Poverty Actions, uh, also British International Investment, and UNDP India. So, and she will um, talk about uh, large scale development of developmental evaluations. So, floor is yours, Aditi. Thank you so much, Professor Reynard. Uh, I'll just go ahead and share my screen.
Uh, please let me know if this is visible to all of you. Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Uh, so, hi, my name is Aditi, and I'll be talking about embedded learning uh, and adaptive management that happens from embedded learning uh, in developmental evaluations. I'm really glad I'm following uh, Ruth because, uh, you know, I'm almost picking up from where she left uh, on learning. So, uh, Quickly, uh, the agenda for the next 15 minutes is going to start with uh, a case study overview of two programs that uh, we've uh, worked on over the last five years. Uh, the reason why I'll just give you a quick uh, overview is because I will then be using examples from this case study uh, to kind of uh, populate uh, what I'm talking about uh, in the remaining part of the agenda. Uh, the other parts of the agenda are about when we learn uh, and uh, how we learn. Uh, we'll focus uh, largely on, on four methods of learning, but uh, these are by no means exhaustive methods as we've been seeing in this series of lectures. There are multiple other ways to learn. Uh, I've chosen these four particularly because uh, they've been helpful uh, in the programs that we have worked on. Uh, so moving on to uh, the case study itself. Uh, the uh, the case study that I'm talking about actually covers two uh, connected programs that ran over uh, five years. And uh, this was a multi-donor, multi-party uh, program. Um, we were studying uh, two different questions in the uh, programs, but they were all essentially answering uh, what is it that uh, can reduce uh, the forced labor prevalence uh, and vulnerabilities of workers in the construction supply chain in one of the South Asian countries. Uh, so here, uh, what is important to highlight is that while these were programs and interventions we were studying, the system we were actually trying to understand was the construction supply chain, uh, because it was hiring, uh, you know, uh, almost the second highest number of workers in, in that region, uh, in this particular supply chain, uh, and it had very unique dynamics. Uh, I'll particularly talk about workers and, and the direct employers of workers in the supply chain, uh, because these uh, were the two levels at which we were conducting our study. Um, our workers were largely migrant workers in the construction supply chain in this region uh, and uh, mostly informal in nature. Uh, the direct uh, you know, contractors that they had, their direct employers, we we'll just call DCs uh, going forward. Uh, they were also small time uh, contractors, usually with team sizes uh, you know, of 10 to 20. And they were working with these workers and had the highest uh, potential to impact forced labor uh, situations for these workers like debt bondage, wage withholding, uh, deception during recruitment, uh, and, and risky work situations. Um, so both of these studies were, sorry, yeah. Uh, so uh, both of these studies were developmental evaluations. One was a per experimental study. The other, uh, the second one, which followed was a randomized control trial. Uh, in the first study, we were actually uh, learning about the kinds of interventions that may help to reduce forced labor. Here uh, with workers, we were testing out things like access to worker helplines, skills training, social security schemes that were being offered to them to reduce their burden to uh, earn as much uh, and which could actually support uh, their families and things like education, uh, health, etc. Uh, and also placements with uh, DCs who were trained in ethical practices. Uh, the, the first study actually highlighted that uh, the last intervention of intervening with DCs was proving to be uh, quite promising. Uh, this was a quasi-experimental study though. And we therefore took it up from there. We also interacted with investors and industry about what would work for them in the construction supply chain. And we found that uh, the DCs or the direct contractors of these workers could be a very potent uh, uh, you know, entry point for uh, uh, us to actually intervene and would be a very important lever for us to intervene with uh, if we wanted to actually uh, reduce uh, forced labor prevalence in the construction supply chain. Uh, and the intervention that we picked up uh, came from some of the learnings we had from these DCs, which was about the fact that they didn't have access to low cost capital and that often impeded their ability to pay their workers on time in full uh, and led to you know situations of uh, wage withholding and debt bondage. Uh, so the first uh, thing that I want to talk about is about when to learn. You may hear echoes of this 
uh, in, in the previous lecture in this particular series where uh, the academic experts were talking about not just learning uh, summatively and exposed at the end of the evaluation, but actually learning more formatively during the evaluation as well. And uh, the examples I have picked up are actually also about learning before and during evaluations and the impact that it can have on the evaluations that we are conducting if we learn uh, before and during and not just after. Uh, I'll probably just uh, you know uh, add a little more color to the one uh, example that I've highlighted here about uh, learning during uh, evaluations. Uh, so uh, the workers that we were working with uh, turned out to have uh, uh, you know families uh, at destination as well as at source. Our initial hypothesis from all the literature around this area had been that you know they would have families at source. So we had designed our intervention to actually deliver social security schemes at source to their families while they migrated at destination because ultimately the worker was having to earn a lot of money to send back home uh, for health education of his family. Uh, but uh, you know, initial monitoring and very quick monitoring, as well as interaction with data enumerators kind of highlighted for us that uh, workers in this particular corridor were migrating uh, with their families, majorly more than you know, 70 to 80% of workers were actually migrating with their families. And this helped us quickly pivot and actually change the intervention itself from source-based uh, to destination-based. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, you know, we may be learning from various uh, sources at various times. Uh, many of the ones that I've listed down here uh, are actually uh, common sources that we use. Uh, some less common sources that we have found uh, being used for learning have been people with lived experiences, uh, you know, who are who have gone through things that you are going to explore in your research. And we found uh, that before even designing the evaluation, when we spoke to survivors of forced labor in the construction supply chain, uh, we got a lot of rich information that helped in our indicator and tool development. Uh, similarly, uh, for uh, learning during, uh, we actually spoke to data enumerators uh, in structured ways so that we could learn from them and ecosystem stakeholders, including, uh, you know, industry, because industry was the point where industry actors were the points where we would actually be scaling up our intervention. Uh, and uh, for them, something like interventions with DCs uh, was turning out to be something that was sustainable, that was scalable in their own supply chains. Um, the, the purposes that they serve uh, while here on the screen already, uh, there's probably one that's worth mentioning, especially which is about uh, adaptive management. If you're learning before and during, especially during the evaluation, there is a way to adaptively manage your program and also to safeguard for any unintended consequences. I'll move on to how uh, we were learning. And uh, you know, one of the first things here that we uh, realized is that the nudge might initially need to come from the funder. Uh, and uh, moving from uh, an accountability mindset to a learning mindset, uh, where we're not just proving uh, you know, things like uh, whether or not we're achieving our KPIs, but we are also open to experimenting. Uh, our funders in particular uh, were very open to experimenting with uh, the theory of change, where everything was not, all the assumptions for the causal pathways were not necessarily based on very strong evidence, but they were based on beliefs and weak evidence that we had collected from qualitative pilots before that. Uh, and they showed a huge appetite for working on this. Uh, also, the conversation around monitoring and reporting was not a KPI-focused conversation of have we or have we not achieved uh, you know, the KPIs, but rather encouraging learning from failures and uh, what kind of adaptations we had to make to actually uh, you know, address those failures, which could then go ahead, create more uh, systemic knowledge for the uh, construction supply chain as a whole and for the uh, interventions that we were doing. So just to use an example of, of monitoring and evaluation, uh, so the monitoring and reporting frameworks uh, that we were using, uh, we uh, initially had for the DCs, we initially had low uptake of the financial incentives. That's the loans that were being given out to them. And we were not meeting our KPIs. The conversation with the funder, though, was not about why aren't we meeting our KPIs, but what were the challenges that were stopping us from meeting our KPIs? And could we adapt for those challenges? And that's exactly what we went ahead to do. Uh, you know, We found out there was a lot of uh, issues with documentation, which we had expected that people uh, with this level of informality would have. But it turned out that they didn't even have some of the basic documentations required for loans and loans were being tested out uh, with this population or with this archetype of population for the first time in this region. Uh, so we went ahead and, uh, you know, uh, 
managed what else could be used as documentation for these loans. And then uh, slowly our, our uh, loan uptake started to grow up. Uh, the second uh, way of learning that I really wanted to talk about was uh, CLA. This is, uh, you know, becoming quite commonplace now. Uh, and uh, particularly here, I would like to talk about uh, learning agendas uh, as resources, as well as reflection meetings, uh, as, you know, cultures and processes that are uh, part of CLA. Uh, in, in our case, we had a learning agenda document right at the start of the uh, study, uh, but also uh, this was a living document that kept changing. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, there were questions around uh, uh, what we were learning. Did we need to unlearn something? Did we need to relearn something that kept the whole thing very uh, adaptive. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to especially talk about were reflection meetings where there was no KPI talk at all. It was like one dedicated or two dedicated hours every quarter where all stakeholders from implementation partners to researchers to investors to funders would come together to discuss what was going on in the program that was helping us challenge the notions and the hypotheses that we had started out with. And when we did this, uh, you know, this led to, again, a lot of changes in not our primary question for evaluation, which was about how we reduce forced labor, but also about secondary questions like, what is the right loan product if loan is a good incentive to give to direct contractors? Uh, the third kind of learning uh, techniques that we used in our uh, studies were uh, CFMs, or community feedback mechanisms. Uh, community feedback mechanisms basically enabled respondents to speak to us when they wanted to, rather than us speaking to them uh, when we wanted to using surveys and FGD tools, etc. Uh, and uh, these were fairly uh, simple, uh, you know, uh, like incoming phone lines uh, or suggestion boxes. Uh, and uh, what they help to do is, is uh, workers, for instance, use the incoming phone lines where uh, they were telling us about risky situations they were in uh, and uh, that were not necessarily coming up through our surveys. And uh, we could learn much more about the sociocultural dynamics of why they did not want to be rescued from those situations with their direct employers, because it turned out that workers were actually uh, often distantly related to these uh, direct contractors who uh, were from the same villages as the workers. So uh, with respect to CFMs, they can sometimes sound, uh, you know, a little expensive to implement, but they can often piggyback uh, on existing evaluation structures that are in place already. In our case, we already had a grievance redressal mechanism as per the safeguarding and ethical protocols of our research to, uh, you know, help and support workers who were in uh, risky situations. And we ended up using that as our CFM uh, through orientation with the workers. So they knew they could call into that line, even if they wanted to share feedback over and above uh, any kind of grievances. The last one is a bit of a catch-all bucket uh, based on whatever I've spoken about so far, uh, but particularly complexity aware uh, monitoring practices really helped us uh, not just predict but actually detect early things that were going wrong because in in such an experimental uh, untested uh, evaluation that was happening pretty much for the first time in this particular region uh, region uh, predicting was not always possible but uh, by using leading indicators instead of just studying lagging ones we could actually pick up uh, a lot of uh, risks beforehand uh, and uh, the other thing that we also did was we layered all our uh, quantitative indicators along with quality uh, uh, you know, feedback from stakeholders. And uh, we, uh, we learned a lot in the process, even when our, our second program, which was a pure quantitative RCT, uh, was actually uh, focusing only on quantitative indicators. Uh, we also learned a lot from disaggregating our data. One example that I would especially like to use here uh, is again about the social security scheme intervention that we had. Uh, we could uh, see that we were essentially um, you know, not meeting our KPIs in, in one of the leading indicators that we had developed for how many schemes we were, we were being able to deliver. But when we disaggregated their data, what we figured out was that we were not being able to uh, do this only in one particular sub-region. Uh, and we then went ahead and did a lot of debriefs with enumerators in that place, uh, community members in that place, as well as implementation partners. And what we realized was that uh, there had been a political change uh, and, and the scheme card had the picture and the name of the older 
third political party, so they would not let us actually, uh, you know, uh, roll out schemes till the card changed uh, with the new political party. So what this helped us do is because we detected this uh, in advance, we just went ahead, replaced it with a scheme that that could, uh, you know, uh, work in our favor as well and was just as useful for workers and would not hold us up in the evaluation process. Um, basically, complexity aware monitoring really helped us learn that if you're not uh, working with our output indicators at the right time and not pivoting and not adapting our program uh, at the right time, we may end up with, uh, you know, sample sizes for the final impact evaluation of these programs and these systemic changes, which are not, uh, you know, uh, statistically significant or like uh, Ruth mentioned, powered enough for us to study. Um, in very quick summary uh, from uh, you know uh, the last 15 minutes, I think uh, learning should be happening uh, before and during, not just after. It should be happening from multiple sources, including the uncommon ones like people with lived experiences, data enumerators, a learning mindset, uh, and a shift from an accountability mindset, uh, as well as CLA practices of learning agendas, reflection meetings can be incredibly helpful for learning. Uh, community feedback mechanisms especially help us uncover unexpected learning that we hadn't planned for, uh, because people are being able to speak to us when they want and on agendas that they want to talk about. Uh, and we can piggyback on existing evaluation structures for this. Uh, and largely, comple uh, lastly, complexity aware monitoring, uh, you know, with the right leading indicators can help us uh, detect risks that we may not be able to predict in such complex evaluations, uh, layered with qualitative root cause analysis. Uh, so I think uh, that's all uh, I had on my slides, and I'd be happy to take questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, very interesting experiences. So before we go into Q&A uh, in more detail, we have a, uh, we try to engage also our, our audiences. So uh, Virgie will, will share a slide or link so you can you can add your reflections and, and keywords that you have been hearing. So Virgi, please go ahead, uh, share that in the chat and, uh, and everybody can, can use that link. So, but I, um, there are, there were, I think a couple of, um, couple of questions in the chat. And again, if you have any, any, any more questions or comments, please, um, now is the time. Uh, so maybe we can start with the roof. Um, there was a question about, do you also consider participatory methods uh, within MEL tools? Or, you know, there's an example of, um, of best practice uh, or an example that, of, of that in a chat. And, and are there any best practices in this space? And that probably goes also for, for you, Aditi, as well, because um, it's kind of similar question, um, things you've been talking about. Yes, um, most definitely they should be um, they should be included. And I think when we developed the standards of evidence 10, 11 years ago, um, it was starting to emerge as something that should be happening. And I think since then it's really developed as a practice. And there is some definitely some really good um, guidance um, out there. Um, it was mentioned at the beginning that I'm doing a study that's looking at evidence yeah. systems in four countries around the world and the use of participatory practices has come out really strongly, um, particularly in um, countries like Canada and Australia where Indigenous rights um, is becoming increasingly to the fore and increasingly important and round around both how evidence is conceptualized and defined, but also as a form of evidence um, as well. So uh, yes, it should be included to answer your question in standards of evidence. And I think increasingly participatory methods are getting more and more sophisticated um, and importantly, more and more used as well, which is which is great. I think we heard from Matita some examples. So maybe you want to um, talk to the same question. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I think uh, the community feedback mechanisms are actually great ways, uh, ways for us to include voices from the community into the methods that uh, we are using. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there are also, uh, also things we can do before we start the evaluation where, uh, you know, uh, people with lived experiences can be used as peer researchers through the entire process of research. Um, 
largely because I work in the modern slavery and post labor space, we've been developing uh, some global toolkits around uh, where, uh, you know, people with lived experiences uh, can actually contribute, whether it's at the design stage of the research, or at the regular monitoring stage, uh, you know, or even at the final dissemination stage or the analysis and interpretation stage. So uh, all of these are fairly participatory in nature. And, and there's definitely, uh, I think, uh, we can start to see um, a trend, at least in some sectors, for sure, where uh, you know this is being encouraged more and more. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's. Um, I think that's something um, I, I find very interesting in, in your presentation, Adit, around sort of stakeholder and ecosystem um, management. Always, or you know, we, we in the institute we very often use the term orchestration, ecosystem orchestration. That this is something that is a a, a skill that public organizations very often don't have developed so much because you know for many various reasons because we work through projects we, we work through call for proposals and, and you know, there might be like a consultation process but it's much less about how do we activate various um, uh, stakeholders in the process and i think um, learning and monitoring is increasingly about that kind of work as well as was, was, was evident and so I wanted to, um, I think, uh, as we are waiting for, for questions and, or comments, I wanted to ask uh, Bartholomew about his experiences um, uh, with using the, the tool uh, that you were um, uh, talking about. Uh, so what are the experiences of countries actually using the tool and how, how you know, what's, what's their reflections? Have they, how, if they're using it, what's, what's the usefulness of this tool, which is, uh, you know, I think it's it's great to show this linkage is great to show progress, but it would be interesting to hear whether there are there are also like feedback uh, from that use to their own, um, you know, evaluation tools or policy making or anything like that. So if there is anything you can share, because I understand it's a relatively new tool, so you probably don't have that much practice. But yeah, if there is anything anecdotally even you can share, it would be very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Um... Actually, um, yeah, we're currently actually training Uganda. This is the second time we're doing um, Uganda in terms of the training. Um, some of the things that come out that are of interest, uh, are one is um, really their understanding of um, how their priorities relate to the SDGs. So a practical example, well, Lesotho is a, is a landlocked country. And so when in devising its plan and analyzing the alignment, they were of the opinion that um, the goal of the SDGs on life underwater, which really is articulated in form of a marine, water is sort of defined in sort of marine terms. So, so they believed initially that, you know, this doesn't relate to, this is not an area that they should be aligned to. But then when you interrogate the SDG itself, even though at the goal level it talks about marine resources, it also has a, a target that talks about overfishing, but not specific to marine resources. So you see initially there's a, within the SDGs themselves, there's a, some kind of a disconnect in the logic uh, because you have a goal that talks about marine, but then when you get to the target, it's, it's not just marine issues. So countries initially dismissed that as an area of landlocked countries dismissed that as an area of you know linkage uh but then when we did that analysis we realized okay so you know you can still be aligned at least you need to have something related to overfishing in your in your plan so it helps them really interrogate their own plans uh and and we really, mm -hmm. really reprioritize or bring new issues in there but I think the most important thing is the logic in their plans, which is reflected in their results framework. How do your objectives relate to your targets and indicators? And really the tool, uh, once the results framework is put into the tool, it tells you some of the issues that they, they have, uh, telling you, you know, specifically how many goals really lack indicator, uh, targets, how many targets lack indicators, and how many indicators lack baselines. And often you'll find that um, countries have these nice plans, but when it comes time to actually tracking performance, they have the targets in the plan, but mm -hmm. 
but you don't see any actual data. So you have a plan that is pretty much lifeless in the sense that uh, the day is not being tracked constantly. And often you have a, a country uh, plans with like thousands of uh, indicators. Like currently, a country we're dealing with has 5,000 indicators. So when, <laughs> when we then uh, interrogate them about, okay, let's, where's the data? How do we, because we're populating the system because we're on a track. Then they realize that, oh, we had this plan, but we've not really been um, paying attention to the actual data. So it, it really is a, an aha moment for these countries to really revisit their plans and make them more actionable, more feasible. Uh, so the alignment is simply an entry point into an analysis of their plan and identifying areas of, of disconnect. And lastly, and more importantly, is how those plans are linked to their budgets. So that discussion also comes up in these discussions and hopefully helps make their plans, future plans more actionable. That's very interesting. I think you're kind of like building an infrastructure of um, data information and, and sort of evaluation. And I think it's, it has been interesting to hear, you know, I think you mentioned in, in the chat before about data availability that you're helping countries here as well. And I think would be interesting to hear whether there is also plans or maybe are already doing like capability building around to you. How do you not only, you know, populate this kind of um, uh, dashboard, but also how you take the learnings away from that, right? As you said, there, you know, the, these are the ha ha moments uh, and the ha moments are like, you know, they're great. And and then it's what are the next steps? It would be interesting to, to hear uh, whether you have plans to help the countries then, you know, the building or the, you know, the capability building around evidence and learning and, um, or anything, it would be interesting to hear. Yeah, absolutely. So once we identify what the challenges are, so for example, with data, we find that it's often not the case that the data doesn't exist, but that it's not accessible. Right. In the sense that uh, different parts of the system may have the data, but it's not been, um, signaled or transmitted to the planning uh, entity. So we then take stock of what are the emerging issues in development planning in Africa. And then we then structure our uh, capacity building services around those issues. We have a, a training institute in, in Dakar that, that, does, that we work with on this. So once we identify the key issues, we then bring in other parts of our uh, ECA, for say the statistics division, the um, trade division, for example, because uh, on trade, for example, you're probably aware that uh, Africa just came up with a agreed on Africa free trade, uh, continental free trade agreement. And countries are supposed to have a, a strategy around the, how they're going to do that. But then these strategies are sometimes also divorced from their national development plans and then you know yeah. question again about uh, 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 financing and so on and so forth so really yes it the opportunities the challenges are identified which then begin uh, 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 give us the evidence to structure our support mechanisms around those challenges yeah exactly that, that's and I think that you mentioned the trade free trade agreements which I think is a really key key point today because we see that the um, US, EU, but also China, they're all increasingly focusing on trade and, and, and industrial policy. So I think this is very important for, for countries in Africa, but also elsewhere really to not to miss the trick here and actually use some of those evidence to, to reignite some of those discussions around industrial policy as well, I think, because that's, and that's where evidence can be, um, you know, very important. We, we know from the, successes of East Asian countries that they were extremely adept at using input output tables of, of, of understanding what are they importing, what are they exporting and how to sort of climb the technology ladder sort of being analytically very, very astute. And I think we are, we're, we are again seeing this kind of window opening uh, particularly around um, green technologies, uh, but also food systems and there's lots of changes going on. So, but I, I wanted to, come to a detail as well. Uh, I see there is in the chapter is uh, information change going on, which is great. Uh, because you mentioned something that's really interesting, this adaptive management. And I wanted to 
uh, understand what was your experience? Does do those practices stay in those organizations, or or or, or this is something that is very much donor driven? And once the donor leave, also the adaptive management practices leave. So, what is your experience here? Uh, so I think um, I, I think I was fortunate enough one to work with a donor that encouraged it, trained us on it, and then secondly, uh, with very large consortium of partners playing very different roles. Uh, what came out at the end of end of I think almost five years, and we're we're towards the end of these studies right now, is that these have now become uh, commonplace not just in that one evaluation of program that. Uh, these organizations have participated in, but in other programs they are doing. So it's kind of uh, disseminating uh, and making its way through uh, other uh, organizational practices that they have. So I think once people see how, how um, effective they are, uh, it's easy to adapt. Uh, and uh, you know, people actually see the the upside of of adapting it. Obviously, uh, if something is very expensive, that's probably a little hard to uh, do. For instance, just you know, even adaptive management through say incoming helplines. Now, running a helpline in perpetuity is is not possible. But what we have done in many of those cases where the funding dried out is we started to direct people to national helplines that exist and perform a similar role. So so we've kind of led leveraged uh, strategic partnerships to continue those processes. Uh, but most of these are fairly inexpensive and it's more, more, or more about a way of working going forward in research and evaluation. That's, that's very uh, easy to continue with and people have done that. Yeah, great, I think that's, that's one of the key lessons actually is that these new practices require at least initial investment and probably they require also nurturing along the way. So you can't just sort of think that organizations are quickly adapting them and then you know run run with them you need to actually you know build capacities and, and pay attention to that and, and and last but not least i wanted to come to you ruth uh you mentioned again something that very very interesting enough a lot of people talk about failure and the, re the importance of failure and learning from failure but i think failures as learning and i think these different kinds of as you mentioned might be really inter interesting to uh poke for more around that so if, if you want to expand on that that would be very 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 good yeah, it's such an interesting um, topic. And as you'll know, it's one that kind of keeps coming back around. And I don't think we collectively are always very good at articulating what it means. Um, and I think the kind of the evidence agenda is can be quite politicised. Um, so within government, um, evidence can be a politicised issue. Um, I was talking to a government staffer in a country, not the UK, another country, I won't name names, um, who was trying to establish an evidence institute um, and officials in government were very keen and it was looking like it was gonna happen. And then a politician said, hang on a minute, why would we admit that we don't know something? Um, and why would we run the risk of, um, it being found out that some of our flagship policies aren't very effective, um, which is surprising, depressing, um, but um, it's kind of the real world context of what innovation when evidence has to come up against. Um, and I just don't think, and I think it kind of symbolizes that we're not quite there yet with the moral and the ethical question of doing the right um, thing. But as you say, it's, it's complicated because a failure is rarely always that clear cut. Um, it's always sometimes a bit of a, a bit of a gray area, but I just don't think we are sophisticated enough um, kind of politically or even outside of government really to talk about it in a in a more nuanced um, way. Um, sure. And it's yeah. Um, and outside of government, it has its complexities as well. If you're a provider organization, um, there are very few incentives to actually evaluate what you're doing if it runs the risk of um, it finding that maybe there are areas for improvement and funders then walking away, um, staff leaving, reputational damage. Um, and we just, okay. yeah, we haven't, I don't think, we don't demand enough of organisations yet, including government, um, to show their workings out and to demonstrate what is and isn't working. Uh, yeah, right. There's another question for you, which just came up. Ruth. Um, so this is many current from from Bob. Many current challenges and uh, missions require long term transformation. Uh, in the many case studies, um, you already have 
what are typical ranges of timelines for the calls and are they perhaps often too short? Really interesting, really interesting. And it's something that, uh, yeah, I'm thinking about on a re research report I'm working on at the moment, which is how long should we stay with um, evaluating something? Um, when do we know enough? When do we move on? Um, I think most areas of uh, social policy beyond health, we probably still need to do a lot more evaluation and testing, but this is a great question. Um, and the kind of economies of scale, how much should individual organizations be evaluated um, from scratch? How much can we transfer from other contexts? Um, really great questions. And I think the timing one is interesting because if we look at this from kind of, you know, the history of scientific discovery, we would say we should continue to be reflecting and learning. But actually, um, if we're being incredibly pragmatic and we've only got limited resource to keep doing this, what is yeah. what is appropriate and proportionate and how long should that um, be sustained? Yeah, and I, th I, th I, should admit, I think there's this really interesting challenge of, um, you know, we think experimentation, rightly so, is very important and learning quickly. Which, would, which is essentially very iterative, very short term, because we want to learn quickly. But at the same time, a lot of those programs, uh, particularly in social policy friends, for instance, but even climate, we're, what we're talking about, or oh, have a decade long, 15, 15 years, whatever uh, time horizons, particularly when we talk about changing human behavior, maybe around transportation, food, sort of all those systemic issues. So I think sort of the clash of timelines is something that uh, evaluation frameworks um, I think some are need to reconcile and this is by no means an easy task yeah so I think so can I just add one final thing on yes, this which I think ahead. sometimes the language around some of this is quite unhelpful so over the last yeah. 10-15 years we've had a real push towards looking for what works and it's I think what works is only as valid as long as it still works um, for as many people and I think it's just much more nuanced than it sounding like it's an end point and I think the danger of looking for what works can signal that our work here is done and we can just move on which I don't think any of us would think would be a particularly uh, yeah a good thing yeah yeah exactly as, as we saw in, in ID this case some of those programs are, are very large scales so there is you know, tens of thousands of people involved so I think there's there is naturally uh, the risk aversion is, 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 is mm -hmm. kind of natural and maybe rightly so actually and so I think there's one more question. I think this is maybe general uh, opinion experience. Do you have about process evaluations complementing the interpretation of the impact finding? Um, so it's, it's in terms of how something was done and then the impact of that. What is your or view if you want to talk to speak to this? Is that one for any me? Of, no, any oh. of you. It's just for everybody. <laughs> everybody, I think, pretty much. Um, I oh. could probably, oh, oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Um, uh, no, I mean, speaking from an organization where we've always been asked to show results, uh, there, there seems to be a uh, emphasis on results, which is mm -hmm. fine. But I don't think uh, we also look at how the results were achieved and why is that important? Um, because to give a very crude example, I mean, you could reduce poverty by simply taking the poor and putting them somewhere else where I mean, where they're not visible, right? But you can do it in a more sustainable way. So the how is as important as the, the end result. And we, I think we need to, in the context of sustainability, we also need to interrogate the how, the processes, uh, to mm -hmm. ensure that uh, the end result is sustainable over time. Yeah, very good. Aditi, Ruth, do you, do you want to add? Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, process evaluations can highlight, I think, uh, many things uh, over and above just, you know, the process itself. And in, in our case, if I were to just use an example, it, it told us a lot about uh, 
what should be our final indicators for assessing impact. So just as an example, overtime is a standard ILO indicator for assessing uh, forced labor impact or forced labor prevalence. Uh, when we actually went ahead through all of these various processes uh, of learning, uh, one of the things that we learned is that in the region that we were studying, uh, overtime, uh, though a necessary evil, is something that people willingly take on because they want to send more money home. So in that kind of uh, situation, uh, when we actually studied the whole process of, of which indicators we are picking, how we're classifying them to, to finally measure our impact, one of the things that we learned is that there is a heavy amount of contextualization involved if we want to actually pick that one indicator to calculate our final impact and and yeah we kind of modified it we did not keep it as a uh, high risk and indicator as we initially had and that came about from all the process learning that we did yeah no i think those guys have covered it um yeah no good 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 yeah i think um uh as often in these kind of workshops we we, we could go on uh, for uh, for a long time because particularly I think evaluation and evidence is the practice of it is first of all very diverse but it's there is also so much that is a um, unknown experimental and actually the I think the process question, question is an excellent one but we have done recently some work with Innovate UK which is an innovation agency here, here in the UK around equity and innovation systems and, and very often in the workshops actually talking to stakeholders the process itself was more important than actual what are the outcomes where we're, we're you know yes we want to have more underrepresented people in the innovation system but actually how do we get there seems often more important than what are the concrete targets how many people we're talking about because obviously we, when we talk about equity and so i think i think that is something that the evaluation methodologies tend to be relatively poor at so far so but i think uh Virgie, i don't know whether you can share the a sort of a word cloud from our Slido activity so far. Um, yes, there is, okay. So you, you can see what what is coming up here as a keyword, logic model and theory of change. And um, good, yeah, I see failure is learning all of these things as well. So that's that's great. I think I, I'd like to thank, we are, all, we are over, over time already, so I'd like to thank our, our presenters today, uh, follow me, Aditi and Bruce. Thank you so much uh, for your excellent in input and bringing your experiences um, uh, to us. And of course, we are also looking forward to all of you joining us on June 7th for the last uh, event in the series where we have, uh, as I said already, I think we have multinational organizations <laughs> presenting their experiences and work uh, from UNDP and, and OSCD and also the um, European Commission work, emerging work around um, evaluating their missions. And yes, if you'd like to give us any feedback, please do so. And thank you so much for joining and have a, have a good day.